Hi, my name is Ebony and I was 45 when I was diagnosed with bladder cancer. I would say I am married. Um, I have three sons. Um, I am an engineer by day. Um, I just want to live my best life like everyone else. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's those are the, I guess, the biggest things. I really want to live my best life and help others do the same. Yeah, so my initial symptom was after um, a visit with my annual, you know, uh, gynecologist, and um, they noticed that there was more blood in my urine or a microscopic level, like I couldn't even see it, um, but a microscopic level of blood in my urine. And they referred me to a urologist to try to look in um, to what was going on, kind of freaked me out, but um, that's how it started, like over two years ago, um, pre-COVID actually. Um, and I proceeded with the urologist. Um, they couldn't find anything. I had different scans, uh, different scopes that were performed and initially couldn't find anything. And so he said, well, you know, we'll just keep you on a schedule. You'll just keep coming every six months and we'll check on you. And, um, you know, maybe you're just one that, like I didn't have any other, uh, Red flags, uh, generally very healthy, never went to the doctor except for my physicals, not on any other medication, no, you know, other high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, no other health issues, uh, was pretty active. So um, the doctor was kind of like, well, we're not seeing any smoking guns, so we'll just keep watching you, right? Um, that's how it started. Didn't have any pain, no other symptoms. So we initially thought it was a UTI. Um, so I was prescribed an antibiotic and then thought, okay, we're good to go. And it kept going. <laughs> so um, then the next thing was, okay, let's check your IUD, go back to your gynecologist, check the placement of your IUD, make sure that that's in place. Did that. Gynecologist was like, yep, it's good. No problems. Um, then they thought, well, maybe it's just, um, we have to confirm that it was, you know, what, what the source of the blood was like, is it just, um, you know, menopausal stuff going on or if it, you know, just what's going on. And honestly, it seems like in hindsight, now I've read and studied that most women are misdiagnosed, um, because I guess our bodies are a little complicated. And so people, you know, go grasp for the, you know, the initial things that may be probable, but all of those things, we were batting zero. I also went to, he referred me to a kidney doctor to look at the functions of my kidneys and all was well. And so, you know, I went back to the urologist and they were like, well, we'll just keep an eye on you. And that eye on me was a check every six months. I wanted to trust my doctors to believe that they would know what was wrong. And when the doctor was telling me, well, we don't know. <laughs> I was like, Okay, if you don't know, yeah, I'm a bit concerned, right? Um, I he even told me at one point, well, you know, there are some people that just over time, you know, as they get older, um, their bodies function differently, and maybe that's just you. And I was like, mm, no, boy, no, like, no, I've never had this as a problem, you know. And so at that point, like a year passes, and now I can actually see the blood in the you know, when I went to the bathroom. And so now I'm like, okay, so now it's more, you know, prevalent. And my doctor is still saying, well, maybe this is just what you'll do, your body's going to do. And I was like, this can't be likely. This can't make sense. Um, I even started gaining weight, uh, particularly in my midsection. Um, and I remember thinking, I never gain weight in my midsection. I always even, you know, with each of my boys, I gained 60 pounds when I was pregnant. Um, but every time I always gained weight in my hips and thighs. And so for me to gain it in my tummy area, I was like, this doesn't seem right. But even the nurse at the practice was like, well, you're in your upper forties, you know, mid forties. Um, maybe that's just, you know, what's happening that you're just gaining weight in a different way. And I was like, mm, yeah, no. So I was very concerned, um, because they couldn't figure out what was going on after a year and a half. And it got to the point where I was like, if they don't find something this time, fast forward, that was September, 2021. Um, I'm going to someone else. Cause at that, so I'm trying to think, I also at that point had had the IUD removed, um, just trying to remove every possible potential, you know, cause, and we still couldn't find anything.
I, I was wondering if there was some underlying something. I was Googling things, trying to figure out. Um, so just kind of confused and lost as to, okay, how, if the professionals don't know, you know, and honestly, I had never heard of bladder cancer, to be honest. And so it it never occurred to me as something to delve more into. And to be honest, I don't ever recall my urologist saying, if you see this additional sign, then maybe, you know, we should dig more or let me know, you know? So, yeah, I was very concerned and stressed <laughs> about like, what could this be? So, um, the, I remember the other thing was I've never, um, like I'm not sick typically. And I remember actually coming out with COVID, um, I want to say September, August actually of 2021. And I remember telling my husband like, okay, now I'm, I mean, you know, everybody was catching COVID, but still I, I was like, I'm never sick. And now all of a sudden here we are. Um, so between that and then I actually started feeling pain when I urinated, I was supposed to go to the doctor, my normal six month, um, check the urologist. Um, I th feel like that August, but due to he, him being on vacation, we rescheduled the appointment. And so I went in again and he said, you know what, we'll go ahead and do another CT. And then we'll see from there. And so we did another um, CT in October. And then he called me in his office and he's like, I, something's abnormal here. Um, we're going to need to do a surgery, have a surgical procedure to see, because I see something. He also did that scope, the same scope that he did like that year prior. And in that scope, he saw something, which freaked me out. Um, so then he's like, uh, we're going to, I actually need to see you in surgery in the next two weeks. And I was like, what? You know, like two weeks surgery. Like my last surgery was, you know, at that point, probably 12, 13 years ago when I'd had my last C-section. So yeah, so we set up the, um, we had the CT, the abnormal CT, uh, the extra scope that was abnormal. Uh, and then the surgical procedure was to biopsy this tumor that he saw or this growth that he saw to see more of what was going on. And I remember when I was like a ball of tears and the nurse that was with me said, you're going to be okay. She was extremely comforting. This was a different nurse. And she's like, I've been through this before. Um, you're going to be just fine. But at that moment, I remember thinking I'm going to die. Like, what is this? You know, how did we catapult from, you know, doesn't seem like much to, uh, not not only it doesn't seem like much to this is probably what you're going to always just deal with because this is just the way your body is functioning functioning to oh we needed to have surgery in two weeks and dig further to understand what's going on so because I remember thinking I've trusted you for a year and a half to try to find something and what was it about everything that has gone on in the past year and a half where you didn't find anything and you know, of course, you know, we trust doctors to trust that, you know, people are going to do things in our best interest. But I began to wonder what other signs were there that maybe you overlooked. So I honestly was a bit angry because I thought I've been coming to you for a year and a half and you haven't seen anything. And now all of a sudden I need to be in surgery in two weeks, you know. So that was one shift. And then the second shift was when he told me specifically after the surgery that the growth was confirmed to be cancerous and that he wanted to refer me to someone else that could better help me. That few weeks, the urologist ended up referring me to um, like a surgical urologist, like one of the top urologists in the area to you know proceed with my treatment. So at this point, I'm like, oh, you're going to take me under. Like, I'm just, I don't know, a bit paranoid, like about like, Am I going to come out okay? Um, and then the fact that you have had a challenging time diagnosing me and now you're about to take me under to try to figure out what this is. Um, so I was Googling left and right, Googling the report to try to figure out like, what are, you know, what does this mean? Um, so that was on November 11th. And then we had plans for Thanksgiving to go visit family. And I will tell you that entire three weeks, um, cause I remember thinking, surely you can, you need, you should be able to tell me what the results are almost instantly. Like, even if it's a week, just, I'm thinking all the worst, 
right? Um, the nevertheless, we went to visit family for Thanksgiving, but the entire time in the back of my mind, I was like, am I going to get this result? When am I going to get the result? And is the result going to be, you know, what I'm, you know, one of my biggest fears. And so fast forward to November 29th, um, they called me in to, you know, come get the results. And I remember thinking, okay, the fact that they've called me in, this can't be good. So my husband went with me for that appointment. And um, that's when I, you know, first saw the verbiage on the, you know, um, report to say that I had, um, was a high grade urethelial muscular invasive bladder cancer. And I was like, what, you know, what does this mean? What stage, what, you know, so I'm just, I remember that was the second shift where I was just devastated, like, I don't know that I've ever cried like that, to be honest, after getting those results. And I couldn't even, my I remember my eyes just welling up, like I couldn't even read what was on the paper, um, just because I was just so emotional from what the diagnosis was. And he was optimistic and, you know, trying to be encouraging in that visit. But I just remember thinking, what if I hadn't come back because I'm listening to y'all and you're saying, oh, well you know, it should be fine. Your body's just maybe designed to work this way. What if I hadn't come back? Um, what if I didn't prioritize this visit based off of some of the other verbiage that y'all were sharing with me, yet me telling you something that doesn't seem right. What if I hadn't come back? And now you're telling me that I've got this aggressive um, tumor growing in my body. And now you're telling me you're going to refer me to someone else because it's a little more complicated than what you thought. Like, <laughs> really? I just remember think, my, my instant thought was, how much time do I have? How much time do I have? Um, yeah, because one, I didn't know anyone with bladder cancer. I'm a bit of a fluke. Like the doctors would say, like, you're a unicorn. Like you checking all the boxes, trying to live a healthy lifestyle. Yet here we are. You've never smoked. You're not an older white male. Yet here we are. So anyway, I, I just, it was extremely devastating for me because I remember thinking that my children are going to grow up without their mom. And that was a space that I've always not wanted to be in because I hated it having to experience it myself. You know, I remember him asking me if I had any questions, but I was like, oh, yeah, I got all the questions, but I don't know what questions to ask, you know? Um, and I don't know if he was just struck by the amount of emotion amount of emotion that I was expressing. Um, but no, there wasn't, it was just more of a, I'm going to connect you to someone else that's going to help you better than I can. And I remember thinking, well, dang, you know, um, I was just so overwhelmed. I didn't even, I didn't know what questions to ask. I, I had a ton of questions, but I really didn't even know, you know, my, of course, some of the main questions were, okay, how serious is this? Like there wasn't any, there was not any discussion at that time of treatment, like, you know, no discussion about any of that. Um, I didn't really get into all of that discussion in, until I met with my um, other urologist. But after that diagnosis, there was a slew of appointments. Like, I can't even tell you how many appointments I couldn't, like every day, it felt like I was at another appointment. And it was a whirlwind, whirlwind of appointments uh, that surprised me, you know, because I had to go to different doctors for them to check my heart, to check my liver, to check all these different um, organs, because the hematologist knew what about what my body was about to have to, you know, undergo. So they were trying to make sure that my organs were going to be able to withstand all of these um, really harsh treatments that I was about to um, start taking. Yeah, the hematologist and urologist worked hand in hand to um, enlighten us on what was about to happen. Uh, my first appointment with the urologist was accompanied with this huge binder, like this three inch binder of tons of information, including a section on um, hospice care. <laughs> Um, but all of it was about the medications that I was going to have to take, the potential types of um, urinary diversion, um, you name it, that binder was the gospel for me for the next several months. And none of, I remember thinking on the cover of that little pamphlet, none of the people that have been diagnosed with this look like me. There were no, um, there may have been one woman on the picture, but she wasn't African-American. Um, everyone on that pamphlet looked older and not like me. 
But I was like, okay, here we go. The urologists talk mostly about what the entire treatment would look like. Um, yeah, the u- urologists talked like beginning to end. The hematologist specifically talked about my chemo. So I would go every two weeks, every Wednesday. Um, and I had four different drugs. Um, the acronym was MVAC. Um, and it was four different drugs. And I would go in for my blood work at like eight o'clock in the morning and then they would administer the chemo um none of it was administered at the same time so you'd have to have different um there was a series and so what the urologist explained to me was once i was done with my infusion then we would have to have a surgical procedure that surgical procedure would absolutely mean the removal of my bladder because of the type of cancer that i had Once it was very clear that the tumor had gotten to the muscle wall of my bladder, the bladder has to come out. Like there is no, there's potential spread to other organs. And so we were very concerned about that. Um, So I had to do additional scans to see how far potentially it spread. Those additional scans confirmed that it only spread to lymph nodes in the immediate area. And I remember thinking like, can't we like get a bladder? Like, can I get something donated from somebody? Like, surely I don't have to lose, you know, like do we have to, is it seems pretty extreme, like, you know? And um, I remember another, a breast cancer survivor telling me, um, well, Ebony, at least it's not breast cancer. And I remember thinking, do you, girlfriend, nothing, no shade on whatever else you went through, but I'm about to lose a bladder. Like I'm about to potentially have to wear a bag outside of my body. We don't even know yet, like what the outcome is going to be. And I can make a choice. But the other concern I had with my doctor, I remember asking him, wait a minute, how many women have you done this surgery on? Like, I know you typically do this on men, older white men, but like, how many have you done this on... (laughs) Like, I need to see statistics. The engineer was coming out in me at that point. And I was very concerned because um, I was reading, Googling. And that because it was muscle invasive already, the bladder would have to go. So there was no, but it was about what to do in that place um, that you had to decide, right? What were your options? Yeah, so there were a few options. Um, well, actually, so there are three with most, with, you know, as far as, what science dictates. There are three different options. My surgeon um, made it very clear that he did two, um, that there were two options. So I could have the bag outside of the body, um, which there's a more technical term for it, but I can't remember in my brain, I was like, okay, that's the option, bag outside of my body that I would need to empty. Um, uh, Then there was an Indiana pouch, which my doctor didn't do. And then there was um, the neobladder, Uh, which is what I decided to go with. But the neobladder, what that consists of is taking a portion of your intestines, your small intestines, and creating a new bladder. So fast forward, if in the middle of surgery, they determine that that small portion of my intestines was not viable um, for um, to be used as a bladder, then that meant that they would have to punt and go back to the bag outside of the body option. So I didn't know, I would not know until I woke up from surgery what what I ended up with. So my prayer was neobladder. That was ultimately what I decided to go with. Um, but he also made it very, very clear that the neobladder surgery is incredibly invasive and much more involved in a longer recovery time. But I was like, yeah, no, that's what I want. Like, <laughs> we're going to figure this out after, you know, researching and seeing. Um, I mean, he also made it very clear that a lot of people, like from surveys, um, 50-50 will say that their quality of life is back to where it was before the surgery. But yeah, and so I decided to go the neobladder route. Um, that's an eight-hour surgery because they have to do three different things. Remove your bladder take some of your intestines, create a new bladder, then reconnect everything. Um, Oh, and my surgery was a robotic procedure. So there are five incisions um, on my belly now um, for him to do all of that. And it blows my mind sometimes now that I'm like, you didn't have to, you know, that's, that's all for all that you just did in my body, five small incisions. Um, but they inverted me apparently during the surgery. So when I came out of the surgery, I was incredibly swollen, um, and kind of, you know, really concerned my husband and they were like, okay, well that's normal. She's just been inverted, you know, yada, yada, yada. But yeah, so the surgery itself was 
it was between eight and nine hours. The surgery was March 30th. Um, I was in the hospital until April 27th. Um, I came home for four days and then was back in the hospital with sepsis for another week and a half. Um, that was extremely challenging. I knew the doctor said the recovery period would be difficult, but it, even still, when I came home, I still had um, bags hanging from my kidneys um, because we were trying to figure out my kidney. My right kidney decided that, you know, I don't know if I want to work right. So, <laughs> so that was a bit challenging. So I had to wear, um, uh, I had a nephrostomy tube and a, and a bag and a, an external bag that I would wear um, to help drain urine out of my right kidney. Um, that was all the way until June 19th. Um, so I wasn't feeling very attractive, wasn't feeling like my best person. Um, that on top of a lot of bone pain from the chemotherapy. Um, like I remember one of the nurses um, talking with me about, so one of the things that comes with when you have the neobladder um, is catheterization, self-catheterization. While it's not something that you know, while everyone's outcome may be different. So some people may only have to catheterize at night. Some people may have to self-catheterize during the day. I remember not even knowing that my urine came out of a different hole. Biggest thing as far as recovery was training my neobladder. So of course now you've got this neobladder, but it can only hold so much. And so you have to train it. And so there was a schedule that was also in that binder that was shared with me on how to um, like empty, I would have to empty my bladder on a certain cadence. And I remember the first time I tried to do it, I, it took me a minute to kind of get the, the, um, sensation down to understand like, okay, how do I actually empty it? And so anyway, there was a schedule for that. And so like every two, three hours, I would initially be trying to empty my bladder. Um, and then that period of time extended, um, overnight, I would try to always catheter before I went to bed. I would also wear a pad when I went to sleep um, because I was nervous about wetting the bed. Um, I don't have to do that now, but um, I do have to, I do wake up in the middle of the night still to empty my bladder. Sometimes that includes a catheter um, at night um, just because it takes me time to empty the bladder. So like sometimes, even now I'm a bit paranoid, like, if I go to the restroom, like in a public restroom, uh, even at work. So this is something I'm still working through. And so that's a bit of a, a challenge for me because, you know, if, if it gets too full, there's potential for infection and, you know, all the things. And so I'm still working through that, you know, in all the materials, that huge binder, it talked about so many things. It talked about the meds that I was taking. I was taking so many meds to, right. And one of those things was you could be hypercontinent, um, lose all ability to control, um, how you use the bathroom. Um, yeah, those were the fears that I had. And then also how it could impact, uh, your sexual relationships, your sexual relationship with your spouse. Um, and I just remember thinking, okay, look, <laughs> this is a whole lot more than, you know, what I initially bargained for. Um, and I would find myself stressing, for what the outcome would be. And that's why, you know, when my husband would come back and say, eh, right here, we're going to conquer the day. We're just going to conquer the day. So, um, yeah, I was extremely concerned about, am I going to have to wear products to manage through the day? Am I going to have to, um, because I work in a, um, manu in a manufacturing facility, um, I was wondering, are my clothes going to fit? Am I going to have to have additional things to use the bathroom? Am I going to have to change what I wear? Um, because I usually would wear fitted things. And so now am I going to have to have this bag that's going to dictate, you know, am I still going to be what I thought was attractive? Um, you name it. I thought all those thoughts. Some of my biggest fears, some of the fears started with the chemo um, because I also started having, experiencing hot flashes. Um, and you know, there were instructions as far as after you have chemotherapy to not engage in sexual relations because of the chemo and potentially passing, um, you know, and endangering your spouse or whatever. And honestly, um, my husband, you know, I, I remember thinking as a woman, 
Am I going to be able to um, help you meet your needs? Um, are you going to be like um, disappointed in, you know, still being married to me? Because now this for better or worse is looking a whole lot worse than when we started 16 years ago. Um, and he reassures me even now, um, Bay, the same guy that helped you through this cancer is going to be with us as we work through, um, you know, getting you back to where you feel comfortable with different things, right? Um, he um, doesn't, you know, he doesn't pressure me or even, um, it's just more of a, um, I'm patient, I'm here. Um, yeah, and that's been extremely comforting as I try to figure out how to get my body to work. <laughs> know that you don't have to do everything. Like I'm, you know, as women, we're used to doing everything. So let your body heal. Like don't be in a hurry to do all the things. Um, make sure that you stay active even on days that you don't want to and have an accountability partner that will help you stay active. So even if it's, I'm walking 10 minutes a day and then you know, in the following week, you're walking 12 minutes and 15 minutes, but having someone meet you to say, okay, girlfriend, let's go walk. Um, that activity was huge for me. Um, even if nothing more than just getting out. Um, I also, um, I had a playlist that was also encouraging to me. So on those days that were rough for me, um, I would, you know, put that playlist on and that would typically help me feel better. Um, those were some of the main things. You know, at the end of the day, no one knows your body like you do. And, you know, in hindsight, I wish I'd possibly gone somewhere else sooner, you know. Um, and so I just challenge everyone out there, if you really at the end of the day you know doctors are doctors but they are practicing medicine they're practicing so they will not know everything but you know your body more than anyone else and all i can challenge anyone out there that's you know debating or is there something wrong should i do more yes you absolutely should like don't debate don't delay um, don't let months go by before you inquire or search more um, again always remember you know your body more than anyone else and don't be fearful of what the outcome can be um, because the sooner you find whatever is going on um, the sooner you can start treatment the sooner you can do the life-saving work um, so that you can be around for those that love you